Good morning. To you who have battled through the snow and the elements and all the things that might have put you off and are here in God's presence and to those that are watching safely at home this morning, the first thing to say is Happy New Year. Now that might seem strange, but it is actually the beginning of the church's year because this is the first Sunday in Advent and in many churches it's where they celebrate the beginning of the church's new year. But it is where we remember the good news that as Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Has died, is risen, will come again. The Lord who is over the past, the present, and the future, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, all things belong to him. And therefore, as we come, we come in hope of the Christ who not only came at Christmas, but who died for us and will return to give us a new heaven and a new earth. So let's begin our worship as we sing, make way, make way for Christ the King in splendor arrives. Make way for Christ is return. Make way for Christ in our hearts. Make way for Christ in our world, for there is our hope. And I'm delighted this morning as we count down all the weeks until Christmas. We have our Advent crown here this morning. And I'm going to invite the Tudor family to come and to light the first candle for us, a candle of hope. And we have Dan and Abby and Ollie and Eve to come and light it for us. Uh, hiding in there, you'll find a, a gas light. It's fossil fuel, I'm afraid. Oh, that's part. <laughs> it's good to just have, have friends light the candle and bring hope to us. So let's pray just now, shall we? Lord, this first Advent candle signifies hope. The hope that you give the world 
in the promise of your return. And so we come this morning and we ask for you to strengthen that hope in us. That just as things are broken in this world around us, you come to make things new. Just as things are not fair and unjust, you come to judge the earth perfectly. Just as we know pain, you come to heal. As we know suffering, you come to dry our eyes. As we know death, you come to bring life. Come, Lord Jesus, into our sin and our indifference, our failure and our fear. Come, Lord Jesus, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. Judge and Savior. We pray together in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I was uh, thinking about films. Has anyone dared to go to the cinema recently? We've, we've gone to one or two films. I, our house at the moment, it's Marvel films. It's the Marvel film we have to go. But I wonder, do you always enjoy going to cinema? Does it make you feel good? Because I was thinking about some of the films that I've watched when I was small, and, and sometimes they, uh, they made me not feel so good. Sometimes there's sad bits in films. For those that are maybe a bit older, Bambi. Hands up who's seen Bambi. Hands up who's cried at Bambi. Yeah, there's a sad bit in Bambi. Because and, and, Bambi, it starts off with, with, with Bambi losing it's his mum, isn't it? But there's lots of other films that have got sad bits in them. The same is true in The Lion King, isn't it? Has a really sad beginning where Mufasa, have I got his name right? Mufasa dies and, and Simba's got to come to terms with that and then all sorts of bad things happen. He has to run away from home and, and, and he's been chased and all sorts of dreadful things happen. Or the Toy Story, has it got a sad bit in it? What's the sad bit in Toy Story? Andy? He loses his toys, yeah. That's really sad. Bit. And when I watched the first ones, that was a sad bit. There, the, the later ones, Andy grows up, and, and parents, that was sad, wasn't it? Yeah, Andy grows out of his toys, and that's really difficult as well. So there's lots of sadness in films. What about other ones? What about Dumbo? Is that sad? We're getting all those oaves. <laughs> Why do we go to the cinema with all these sad things to make us cry and feel sad? Or up? I mean, Up just starts with sadness, doesn't it? If you've seen all these films, you have known all the sadnesses that's in them. Finding Nemo. Now, you can't be sad about Finding Nemo. Nemo's really... Has that got a sad bit? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Because it starts off with Nemo getting lost and his dad having to go and find him and, and, and all the sadness of being away from somebody and separated. Yeah? Yeah? Anyone cried at E.T.? Oh, you children of the 70s. <laughs> yeah, but again, really sad bits of people getting lost and being far from home. Titanic. Don't spoil the ending if you haven't seen it. Not spoil the ending of that, you know. But yeah, again, really, really sad. And now we've got Forrest Gump there. More sadness. Lots of, lots of sad things. Anyone else think of films that they've seen that have made them feel sad or television programs or anything? Anything ones I've missed that are really sad? Sorry? Football yesterday. Yeah, I know. Well, it depends what team you support, Andrew. <laughs> Sometimes it's, yeah. Anything else? 
A wonderful life. Yeah, lots of folk watch these ones at Christmas and it really brings out all that sadness and that, that, that nostalgia. Yeah. Frozen. Yeah. They've got sad bits in it too. Sisters falling out. Yeah. And that's... Yep. So lots of sad bits. Are those sad films? I missed that. Something impossible. Baking impossible. Right? Did the cake collapse? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, lots of other ones. One more. Yeah, some of the Harry Potter movies are... Yeah, with Dobie... I, 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 I cried at that too. Yeah. Lots of sad films. But, you know, one of the good things about films is that many sad films, not all of them, but many sad films end up having... A happy ending, don't they? Can you think of some of the great happy endings that you've seen in film? Can you? Disney films always have a happy ending, don't they? Normally, it ends up with the, the prince man and the princess, and they all live happily ever after. Yes. Um, any other films with a really happy ending? All right. That's the opposite of Andrew. Sometimes football teams win, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Then you're happy. Eh? It does happen. Right? Any other ones? Cinderella, yeah. Got a really happy ending. The bad witch gets defeated and the, the Prince Charming comes and they, they live happily ever after. In fact, if you go through most of the, the children's films, the family films, they have good endings, yeah. Sleeping Beauty, because she wakes up, doesn't she? Yeah. Tangled, yeah. All these Disney ones have really, really happy endings. Things get sorted, everything gets right, and that's the good bit at the end of the story. But you know, films mark sometimes how life is. We have lots of things in our lives that can be sad. Sometimes just a little bit sad for a while. Sometimes things that can leave us heartbroken almost for the rest of our lives. Things that are sad. And all we have to do is turn on the news just now to realize that there's lots of things in our world that just make us incredibly, incredibly sad. But you know, on Advent Sunday, we remember that our faith in God tells us that this isn't how it ends. The story of Jesus is a story also with sadness in it. Jesus died on the cross, and we know the Easter story, and his friends were really, really sad as all their hopes and their friend was dead. But it didn't stop there, did it? On Easter, we know the good news that Jesus rose again, and he was with his friends again. But at Advent, we remember that not even that was the end of the story. Because it's not just that Jesus came alive again, but the Bible tells us that Jesus will come back one day. He will come back and he will reign over all of this broken world. And that's what we remember today. That's why we have hope and we're lighting a hope candle. And the Bible tells us, and here's from the book of Revelation, these words, on that great day, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away the tears from their eyes, and there'll be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, because the old order has passed away. And Jesus says, I am making everything new. And so as Christians, we can look at the end of the story, and we can know that promise of God, that even though at times it is very sad, and painful, and things we get angry about, we have a confidence that one day this whole world will be fixed and repaired and all of the things that are wrong and sad will be put right. Is that good news? And that's why we say Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Well, we'll try that again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, 
Christ will come again. That is the hope that we have as Christians. And we're going to sing of that just now. We're going to sing a song which allows you to even dance a bit or certainly smile or clap along. Soon and very soon we're going to see the king and it reminds us that our king Jesus one day will come and rule over all the earth and everything will have the ending that we desire. Sunday school go off because they have to rehearse for the nativity that they're going to be showing us when all these candles are lit. to turn to God's Word now and read from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Now, I actually was away um, Monday through till Tuesday. I, I, I regularly get invited to go to a, a conference for preachers, and there it so happened that we were looking at the book of Revelation, and um, they gave us lots of different ways that we might preach it and different themes that we might bring up, and one of the preaching plans was how to preach right through the book of Revelation in 28 weeks. It's all right. We're not going to do that. Um, but we are going to spend a little bit of time on it. We started it last week. We looked at the first chapter. And I'm actually going to skip right to the end. Because actually that's what Revelation's all about. It's about the end. So we're going to read the second last chapter, chapter 21. So let's pray. Father, as we read your word of promise to us, we pray that these ancient words, with all the imagery that we perhaps struggle with, might just melt our hearts today in love for you and in hope of all that you have promised. Amen. Let's read God's word from Revelation chapter 21. John is having this vision that he is giving to the church. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came down and said to me, Come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who had talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be twelve thousand stadia in length as wide, as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper. The city was made of pure gold as glass. The foundations of the city were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation with jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolith, Chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amorist, the twelve gates were twelve perils. Each gave each gate was made of a single peril. The gate, the street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty And the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written on the Lamb's book of life. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. I don't know about you, but if there was a picture of this week that made me stop and think, it was the picture 
of groups of refugees getting onto boats in the November storms in the English Channel. Whatever the politics or the thoughts about that, it really breaks our heart, doesn't it? Just to see people going through that. And it left me thinking initially, what terrors must they be fleeing from that they are driven to do that and to take that risk? But the interesting thing was on the BBC's website, there was a very short audio clip by the author Michael Murpurgo. Some of you will know him because he writes a lot of children's books. And Michael Murpurgo had almost a poem written as an imagined conversation between some of the folk on one of those boats. If you haven't heard it, go listen to it. Because it gave me a different way to look at all of this. Because he imagined a conversation that wasn't about fear of what they were leaving, but about the hope of what they were going to. As they began to talk about Britain, about Britain as being their place of asylum, their safe place, of imagining that people would welcome them when they got off that boat, that people would give them a safe place to stay, that they would have a land that they could call home, that they would have a freedom to practice their religion where they had been abused before, where they would have no fear of persecution, where they would be able to express their political views without any fear that somebody would knock the door. And suddenly thinking about those people driven not by fear, but just as much by hope of a better tomorrow, of a belief that there could be a better life, a better future, a better land, a better city for them and for their family. And that hope of the future was driving them on to endure what was almost unendurable in the journeys and the refugee camps and the danger that they faced. It also left me humbled, and at this point I will risk being a bit political, with realizing that their hopes and dreams were in our hands. We sometimes moan about the land we live in, don't we? And then we realize it's all some people want. The book of Revelation is written in the end of the first century. And it's a time where God's people are going through a terrible time. A dangerous time, a desperate time. They are being persecuted for their Christian faith. They are being misunderstood by their families, many of whom will be pagans. They are being rejected by the cities that they live in because they will not honor the city gods and the emperor. It is a dangerous time to own the name of Jesus. They are suffering. The emperor Domitian is the first emperor who organizes an oppression, a persecution of Christians. They are scared. They are being killed. Some of them are not enduring. They're giving up. They're going back to their paganism. And here is John giving them a vision. A vision that is given to seven small churches, which gives them a hope for the future. Tells them of a better land, of a better future. You see, when you read the book of Revelation out of that context, it can seem like a book for nutters, can't it? All these wild images of beasts and monsters and scrolls and all the rest of it. And the only people who seem to be fascinated by it are, are folk with their conspiracy theories who are trying to work out the date of the end of the world. And, and, and we shy away from all of that. But it makes much more sense when you read it remembering that context and you read the last chapter first. Because John is giving them a vision of a new heaven, a new earth. That's his gift to them. Giving them a vision of a beautiful place to live where there is no tears or death or mourning or no crying and no pain. 
I can have the What he's offering them is a living hope. And that living hope is a hope for life. It's not speculative. It's not a magic code that you can work out the date so you know when to buy your lottery ticket or anything like that. It's very, very practical. Because the question Revelation is asking, and we would see that if we'd looked at the first few chapters, we'll maybe go back and look at them at some point, is this. How do we encourage a Christian people not to give up, to keep serving, to keep loving, to keep enduring? To keep close to Jesus. Not to go back to their godless life. And the answer that John gives is to give them a life-transforming hope of what God is going to do in the future. Now, Revelation isn't just panning people on the head and saying everything will be fine. In fact, the last 20 chapters before we got to the last chapter, I've been saying quite the opposite. They've been saying that the world that hates you and is persecuting you may well get more violent, more nasty, more brutish, more unjust before God brings those final days where there is so much hope. But what John wants to give them is this promise in Jesus. And as I explore this with you today, I, I want to offer same to you. Whatever you're going through just now, whatever discomfort, whatever discouragement, whatever pain, whatever trouble, whatever grief, whatever trials, to say this to you, stay close to Jesus. Trust him. Go on with him and be faithful with him, no matter how tough it gets, because you too have this living hope. This living hope. The central image of Revelation 21, and it it is a metaphor. This whole thing is a metaphor that helps us to understand the truth. But the central thing is the holy city. And look what it says. Verse 2 here. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And that's repeated in verse 10. The holy city coming down out of heaven from God. Now, here's the strange thing about using that as a central metaphor of hope. It's not how most Christians think. You see, most Christians today think that our hope is to go up to heaven. When we die, we go up to heaven. We leave this earth and this body and we go up to heaven. But here is John giving a hope and he says the opposite is true. It's about heaven coming down to us. That's God's master plan. Heaven coming down. The holy city comes down from God to the earth. And it's an image actually of the central hope that Christ returns. Bit odd, isn't it? But I want to suggest to you this is not unimportant. Heaven coming down to earth to make everything new. That's why we pray, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May all that we believe about heaven come on the earth. And if you think about it in this terms, if you think about the gospel stories, and see, when other parts of the Bible confuse you, I would always say, come back to the story about Jesus. Right? Because that's, that's the bit that we can get our heads around. That's the bit that we're given. Think about it this way. Jesus died on the cross. And then he went to heaven and was with his father. Is that the story? Is it? Is that the Easter story? Jesus died and he went to heaven. And then he was happy because he was with God. The end. And we can die and go to heaven too because of that. Is that the story? No, it's not the story, is it? Because the story of Easter is that Jesus died and he rose again on the earth. That's the Easter story, isn't it? It's not just that Jesus died and he paid for our debt, so he went to heaven and we can go to heaven too. Jesus rose again. That's the center of the Christian hope. And that seems a bit strange until you think of it this way. The Bible says that when Jesus rose again, Paul says that was the first fruit. 
That was the deposit. That was the first installment of God's great promise. That one day, all of us would rise again too. What happened to Jesus would happen to all of God's people. We would have a new body. We would rise and we would walk and we would talk. It's why at funerals, we do not say as we're committing someone into the hands of God, oh, that's it, they've gone to heaven, do we? What do I say at every single funeral service I ever take? It's these same words. We may sing the same song sometimes and we don't always sing the same, you know, the, the, the Lord's my shepherd and abide with me. But we always say the same words. We commit them in the sure and the certain hope to the resurrection, to eternal life through Jesus Christ who also died and was buried but who rose again. What does that mean? It means that the final hope of Christians isn't that we'll die and go to heaven, that's the end of it. It is that we will not live some eternal life floating on a cloud in a disembodied body and nothing there. It's actually that God will give us new bodies just as he gave to Jesus. And we often say, what's that like? I can't get my head around that. Maybe you're feeling that just now. I can't get my head around that. And again, I would just simply say, see if you can't get your head around it, just read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And read the resurrection account of what happened to Jesus after he died. Now, if you notice that, you see Jesus, and he's different. And yet, they recognize him. Well, eventually. And they say, it really is you. And they talk with him. And they walk with him. And they touch him. And they have dinner. <sighs> Fish suppers. A lot. You know, it's, it's strange. You think of all the things that the Bible might want to tell us about the resurrection life. and All the questions we've got. And the one thing that the Bible keeps coming back to was the eight things. Bread and fish and wine. And it's actually quite true of the Bible. The Bible, all the time, it, 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 it wants to describe what eternal life is like. It keeps talking about eating. Banquets and kingdom halls and, and feasts. And, and I, I just love that. You know, people will sometimes say all that talk of, of the life, the eternal life is just pie in the sky, wouldn't they? It was not pie in the sky, it's fish in the dish. It's fish in the dish. It's eating fish suppers. I can cope with that. It's not hovering in clouds. It's physical. It's bodily. It's hugs. It's walks. It's dancing. And it's fish suppers. You know, Revelation 21 gives us some of this. It picks up on this whole idea of a, a new creation. And we think, what will it look like? And well, 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 we know what creation looks like when it's good. Because that's what God made right at the beginning in Genesis. So when we try to think, what will it be like when God makes everything new and good? Well, it'll look like the good world that God created. It won't be floating on clouds. It will be physical. Because that's good. Now there's a whole other lot of things in, in, in this passage that I, I just find absolutely fantastic. You know, it doesn't just say that there's no crying and no tears and those things we can perhaps begin to understand what that is. It says weirdly that there is, verse 1, no longer any sea. Now, I never worked out why it was that, that John wanted to say when that heaven comes to earth and everything is perfected, there will not be any sea. And so I read the commentaries and it, it told me a whole lot of stuff about the fact that the Jewish people didn't like the sea. They thought the sea was a place of, of, of evil. It was where the, the, the Phoenicians invaded from. It's where the Philistines, the sea peoples came from. And so they looked to a day where there wouldn't be any fear. There wouldn't be any sea. And I didn't really understand how that felt, although I, I did the academic stuff until I, again, imagined an immigrant in the channel and you say, what will it be like when, when God makes the world anew? And you say, there won't be any sea. Suddenly, this becomes real. Just like it will say later on that they will not have to lock the gates. Nobody will be nicking your stuff. Nobody will be breaking in. 
And we know a little bit of that if you've lived in a community where everybody cares and loves for one another and no one has to lock their gates or their doors. And some of you maybe grew up in communities like that, not many. We begin to get a a glimpse of what it is. Imagine the best things about this world. Imagine the wonderful things, the wonderful times, the wonderful relationships. And now imagine them without all the pain and the sadness that sometimes accompanies them. And you are beginning to see what it is that God has in store for us. You know, we worry just now about a new variant of COVID. They're calling it Omicron, aren't they? You know, if, you, if you know any languages, Omicron means O minor, the little O. And I just was reading this just now, and it says, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I'm bigger than them. Verse 5 says that he is making everything new. But it doesn't say that he's making a whole bunch of new things. He's saying he's taking the things that are and making them new. All the best about creation it is the beauty, the wonder, the brilliant moments, the society we enjoy, which we know is broken and painful, and therefore it can never satisfy us, and we yearn for it to be whole. And that is what is being offered here in the holy city that is coming down from God. Verse 3, it says, a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. You see, right from the beginning in the Bible, and we, this is why we did the first three chapters, or four, four chapters of Genesis, because you remember, God made everything and he said it's good. There was no pain in it. And in that image, God walked with Adam and Eve. They walked in the garden. They had a perfect relationship with God. And that allowed them to have a perfect relationship with each other. And then what happened was that sin came into the garden. And the first thing that happened was their relationship with God was broken by sin. And that resulted in their relationship with each other and with nature and everything being broken. But here at the heart of it, it is saying that we will have a perfect relationship again with God. God will no longer be at a distance from us. He will live with us. My mic's dropping out here. Well, I'll just use this one. It means I have to stand still. Or not. But I I, I love this verse. It, It says, verse 22 I did not see a a temple in the city because the Lord God and the Lamb are its temple. And I I just just see all all, all these ministers and priests and popes when they they get to that great day and they look and think, we're unemployed. There's no temple in this city. You know, John Lennon, when he, when he, he gave his image of what a perfect world would be like, what did he say? Imagine there's no religion. And that was said so that it would offend all the religious people and it would offend all the churches that he was imagining a world with no religion. But here's the thing. The Bible says when the Lord returns, there will be no religion. There will not be any sacrifices. There will not be any temples. There will not be any churches. There will not be any priests. John Lennon is right. But why won't there be any religion? Because everybody will know God fully. And on that point, John Lennon is dead wrong. Imagine a world where there isn't a need for a church because you don't need a sacred space to retreat into because every space is sacred. Where you don't need a place where people are free to talk about God because the presence of God is everywhere. Where you don't need to have something that gets you into the right spirit because God just walks with you. And you know his peace and his love every minute of every day. That is what is on offer here. And the other thing to notice is this. What is the central image here? It's a city. Now, what's strange about this is that you might have thought it would be a garden. You know, when perfection comes, we'll have peace. We'll be away from all these people. All this noise, all this complications. It'll be like Genesis again, walking in the garden, just two of us with God, not with any people at all. But you know what this city is saying? Actually, God is going to take up 
all our relationships, all our living together redeemed. It will be full of people that will not shut its gates because people will not need to be defensive. People will not need to be territorial. People will live in no fear of each other. There will not be locks. There will be no more loneliness. There will be no more cliques. There will be no more exclusion. All the things that we have loved about people without all the problems. You know, the only one thing, worst thing about having people in your life is not having people in your life. But either way, you get pain, don't you? Why do we need this? Why do we need this vision of the future? Well, sometimes folk have said of the Christian church, the problem with the Christian church is it spends so long thinking about heaven doesn't actually think about the world it lives in. Have you heard that? You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly use. But remember that the opposite is true. Because what John is saying to this battered church is this. If you have this vision of the glorious hope of the gospel that is coming down to the earth, that this is the future and this is the end of the story, then you will be free to live sacrificial lives right now. Because you will not be holding on to your little bit of joy and your little bit of turf to the exclusion of everybody else. You will be free to live lives for God no matter the cost. You will be useful in the transformation of the society around you. Because you're not trying to grab on to little bits of happiness no matter what. But you're willing to see that those little bits of happiness point to that which you've been promised. And so you can live differently. And you know the thing is, it worked because it enabled the church not just to endure its suffering and stay loyal, but that tiny little church, those little Christian minorities, transformed the whole world until the emperor himself became a believer. And the kingdoms of the world became the kingdoms of the Lord. They struck them down, they rose up. They persecuted them and told them to be silent about Christ. They shouted all the more. Until Tertullian once wrote, the seed of the martyrs, the, sorry, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Because as people saw how the Christians endured, they began to say, what have they got? What's their promise? What's their hope? How can they do that? And they began to want to know more and more about Jesus Christ. That hope of a new heaven and a new earth that belief that one day the Lord will come and he will judge and bring justice on the earth. And therefore, what we do today matters. What we invest in today matters. Because one day there will be justice. If you are in a place where you are being persecuted and your persecutors win and there is no end to it, then you look for that day that the Lord will return and there will be justice for the poor. There will be justice for the oppressed. There will be justice for the person that has been killed or murdered and nobody ever found out who did it. All of this makes sense. You know, we will close our service today by singing glory, glory, hallelujah. That song was written at a pretty terrible time. It was written in, I think, 1861 in the United States in the midst of slavery and oppression when the huge war was going on which was killing many thousands of people. And Julia Ward Howe, who wrote it, wrote this hymn which we will sing which talks of God's judgment to come. The Lord is coming in all his glory. But she didn't write it in order that folk would say, oh, well, that's fine. Therefore, we can just sit and don't worry about it. God will sort it all out so we can have pie in the sky when we die and that'll be fine. She rather wrote it as the battle hymn of the Republic. As Christ died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. And it was written at a time that it was going to encourage people to carry on with the fight that they were going on, that they would liberate the slaves and that they would make a difference in the world. And Julia Ward Howe, after she wrote this and after the Civil War was over, went on in that vein. She became a campaigner for women's rights and for social justice and actually for an end to war in pacifism too. It was a hope 
which drove people on. So how do we get this? How do we know this hope is ours? It's interesting that it starts, as we've said, with that part in verse 3. God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. Where does that take us? It takes us to God coming and, and, and dwelling among us. God with us. Emmanuel. It takes us to that Christmas story. But it takes us somewhere else. Because as we said from Genesis, one of the effects of sin was that there was a separation. People didn't have that relationship with God anymore. They were separated from Him. And religion was all about trying to get to God, trying to find a way of having a relationship with God by building bigger temples, doing more sacrifices, building big towers. But here, at the heart of the gospel, God came to them in Jesus Christ. And as he died on the cross, he cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that point, Jesus was taking on himself that separation from God. That separation from God caused by sin. That separation from God that is the root of all the pain and all the wrong relationships and all the brokenness and all the selfishness and all the injustice that followed, as Genesis tells us. He took all that on himself and died on the cross. And as he died on the cross and took that, cur that curse, we're told by the gospel writers that something happened in the temple. Because in the temple, there was the Holy of Holies, which signified the presence of God. And then there was a huge big curtain, which signified that people were far from that presence. And only once a year could the high priest break through. And we are told at that point that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. In Jesus dying, God not just came and lived with us, which is the heart of the incarnation, but God broke down the barriers. He took the pain, he took the sin that we might know him. And that hope that we have is that as we accept that Christ died for us, then we accept also that promise that one day as he rose again, we too will rise with him into this new creation, into this new place, this new heaven and this new earth. And that's why for Christians, this isn't pie in the sky when you die. This is Jesus. He is our hope. He is our alpha and our omega. And the book of Revelation invites us to see just how big this victory in Jesus is that we might stay close to him, that we might walk with him, that we might trust in him, that we might give our lives to him, that we might be willing to fight through the snow to be in his presence with his people, that we might be able to get up when it's inconvenient, that we might be able to make the phone calls when it's tough, that we might be able to speak of people about Jesus when our hearts don't want to. Because we have this vision of all that he has offered and all that he is bringing when this world is made new again. This is the Advent hope. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. We're going to sing, Great is the Darkness.
that covers the earth, oppression, injustice, and pain. Nations are slipping in hopeless despair, though many have come in your name. Watching while sanity dies, touched by the madness and lies, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. rise with power and love, this glorious gospel proclaim. In every nation salvation will come to those who believe in your name. Help us bring light to the world, that we might speed your return. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your Spirit, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your Spirit on us today. Great celebrations on that final day, when out of the heavens you come. Darkness will vanish, all sorrow will end, and the rulers will bow at your throne. Our great commission complete, then face to face we shall meet. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit, we came before we just a few announcements um, I, it was great this morning just before the service uh, a few of us met in the hall next door to pray and just to pray that God's presence would be with us as we were here now with the snow um, I know that that was difficult for many folk this morning but I would encourage you if you possibly can come and join us for prayer um, between 10 and 10 30 in the hall next door um, it's okay to come in late it's okay to leave early if you've got other things that you, you have duties to do. And you will not need to pray out loud, but we're just going to gather uh, and call that God's Spirit would be in our services and in our gathering together. You know, we have a sort of half joke, don't we, every Advent about when the tree should go up. Um, some of you are earliers that want to put it up about, you know, September. Uh, um, I confess to being a later, I would put it up on Christmas Eve. But actually, you know what, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that the season of Advent, we used to get closer to God. Because that's what makes Christmas not just a moment of relief that we enjoy, but it, a pointer to everything that's promised. So my encouragement is to spend more time thinking about how you use this time to grow in your walk with him than worrying about whether the Christmas decorations are up early or late. It may well be that you've already got um, a way of, of reading the Bible um, on, a, on a regular basis. Actually, when we joined the church, we all promised to be regular in reading the Bible, but it's one of those promises I suspect most of us break almost every week. What I've got is some little books from the Bible Society. And these just are, they're little advent can calendar, as it were. They, they actually start on the 6th of December, so it's a week and Monday. And they've got one page for each day. With a, sometimes it's just a verse, and then there's a prayer, and there's a thought. And it would take you, if you wanted, just five minutes less than that to read it, but it might encourage you to pray. I got 50 of these. I can get more. Um, they are, there's some down here, if you're going out that way for a cup of tea. And there's some 
at that middle pillar. I'd like these all went, but I don't want to just hand them out because it may well be that some folk have got their own way of, of reading. But if that would be helpful to you, please take one. As I say, we can get more and use it from the 6th of December. Um, don't worry about the date. You could start early. It wouldn't matter. I mean, then if you miss a few, but just to get you reading the Bible. The other thing we're going to do is that on the Thursdays through Advent, I, I, I'm going to we'll send out a link tomorrow for a Zoom. Um, at the moment, meeting is, is a bit difficult for many folks, so we're going to have a, a Zoom Bible study just on the Thursdays through Advent. It may just be two or three of them um, on Thursday. We'll start this Thursday at 7.30, just for 45 minutes or so, and we'll, we'll go through some of the Advent stories from the Gospels uh, and just read them uh, and talk about them and share together. Come and join. Um, again, you won't need to speak if you don't want to, but you'll be more than welcome with that. Let's pray. Father, at the beginning of this Advent, we, we want to thank you for all we anticipate in Christmas. In fact, we want to pray for our Christmases, Lord, because in that anticipation, there's also some fear that plans could be disrupted. And we want to pray, Lord, that you would enable us to have safe Christmases this year and bless us in the plans that we make. But more than that, Lord, we would pray that Christmas would, would remind us of your love. Not just the cutes of the children or, or the enjoyment of a mince pie or a tinsel, but these things, as they remind us of the best in the world that is, would point to all that you have promised. We pray that this Christmas you would fill us as we prepare for it, our hearts with love and with hope. But Lord, also in this season of Advent, we pray not just for Christmas, but we pray that you would give us this sense of the promise that you've given us of a new heaven and a new earth. That that which began at Christmas would be completed in all that you've promised. So fill us with hope, but fill us with hope that encourages us, Lord, to, to shake up our apathy, to wake up, to roll up our sleeves. For we are engaging in a work that transforms the world and we know it works because we know you're doing it. Oh Lord, we pray today for those in peril upon the sea. We pray for those that have found their lives so intolerable that they've had to move in hope of a better life at tremendous risk that they've traveled through nations and taken risks. And we want to pray for them today. Lord, we don't have all the answers and we don't pretend that they're easy. But grant us as a nation and grant the peoples of Europe compassion and welcome and love. Grant wisdom to our leaders. Grant them a boldness to face down those who would say that we should only care for our own and we should lock our doors. Give them a vision of all that you have promised in a new city and of the justice to come. O oh Lord, as we hear of new variants of this disease, Lord, this virus, we pray that you would make us bold and wise. We pray that our reaction to it would not be to close our doors, but our reaction to it would be to love our neighbors. Oh Lord, give us the strength, even when we are tired, to care for each other through this. Give wisdom to our leaders. Give skill to our scientists. Give resilience to those who work in our hospitals and look after our NHS. Oh Lord, into our pain come. And through our joy, give us a deeper vision of the joy that is to come. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's close with singing, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Some of the images in this are, are, are difficult to understand. I, I spent ages with, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ is born across the sea. I have still not got much of a clue what that means. 
I think it's got something to do with the fact that the lily is the sign of the Virgin Mary and that we're, we're looking to the fact that though Christ was born a long time ago, still this hope of his return. But we know something of the glory. So let's sing this in hope and let it be our battle hymn to stand with courage for Jesus Christ. have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where his grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fatal lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the harm and hearts before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. With the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me As he died to make men holy, let us live to make all free While God is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah The glory of the morning on the wave. He is wisdom to the mighty, he is succor to the brave. So the world shall be his footstool, and the soul of time his slave. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. May hope fill you, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit be yours this Advent season and forevermore. Oh.